Merry Christmas. <laughs>
My mama told me something when I was growing up that has forever changed my life. She played the piano at our little church at 3rd and Pine Street for 37 years. She tried to teach me to play the piano, <laughs> but I wasn't very good. She would teach me the names of the notes, what a major key is, what a minor key is. She tried to teach me musical theory, but I was just bored. Then, one day, she told me that the best news in the world is found by playing a simple scale on the piano. I had no idea what she meant, so she told me to play an eight-note scale. So I did. I said, how is that good news? And she said I played it incorrectly and that I needed to play it the other way. So I did. Again, I said, how is that good news? And she said, I played it the right way, but I needed to add the pauses. The pauses? She said, the pauses. Add them on the first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. Now, I was frustrated and said, how can eight notes with random pauses be the best news in the world? Then I got up, walked away, and went outside. Frankly, I didn't care what she was talking about. I didn't like playing the piano anyway. Well, years later, my mama got sick and passed away. As I was thinking about her, I remembered what she told me about the piano. Not only that, I still remember the notes she told me to pause. The first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. So I sat down at her piano and played the scale with the pauses. And that's when I realized the good news she was talking about.
11 says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And I'd like to preach for a while this morning from the subject, A Savior is Born. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help us to really make this personal. Our Savior is born. Lord, he is, Jesus is the Savior of the world, but he specifically is each one of our saviors. It's, it, it's personal. God, he loves each one of us. He is a gift to each one of us. And Lord, we need to understand what that means to us and, and how it affects our lives. It affects eternity, God. What a, what a wonderful promise that is. A Savior is born, Lord, and certainly I need saving from myself, and I'm so grateful for his coming. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I am glad, uh, you know, to have you here this morning, and I know it's Christmas Day, and I have to say, um, this idea of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, and having a Savior come into the world, it's been really good, and um, to have two small little girls in the house at Christmas this year has really made me kind of appreciate Christmas, you know, in a way that I haven't uh, recently, just being, you know, Judy and I, um, embracing the joy of Christmas. And, Cass, and Callie, I, I use their names interchangeably, pretty much. So Callie, uh, you know, repeatedly saying, well, it's Jesus' birthday. And it was so good to hear, hear her, you know, say that and realize it. But, you know, it is so important what Christmas is all about and to appreciate that. And, and I believe as a Christian, I certainly believe, and I, many of you have heard me say this, as New Testament Christians, I believe we live in the reality, we are supposed to anyways, live in the reality of Christmas every day of the year. We live in the reality of Good Friday and Easter. They should be at play affecting how we live our lives every day, 365 days a year. But that doesn't mean it's not a good thing to, to, to pause occasionally at times like this and remember specifically these, these gifts that God has given us through his the birth of Jesus, and of course his his death and resurrection. And I'm I'm glad that we're here today. You know, a lot of churches uh, uh, are not meeting because it, because it's Christmas. Some canceled with the weather, and uh, I just I find that I don't want to do that. You know that, and I guess it's time to remind us again. Uh, it, Normally speaking, if, if I can get here, we're going to have church, but if you don't feel safe, by all means, don't put yourself at risk by coming, but I like to have church when we can. And certainly on this day, people say, well, you know, be with our families and stuff, and I, I get all that, but this is like one of, what, the top two most holy days of the year, that we should take at least a little bit of time together together and remember that. I, I saw... Um, uh, Statistics come out recently that since compared to pre-COVID, church attendance in this country is down 41%. That's crazy. And you know, we didn't really do it, but a lot of churches, they, they didn't meet for a year, at least months and months. And when you tell people, well, it's not that important, you know what, when you open back up, guess what they think? Well, I guess it wasn't that important. So... They haven't gone back, and I think that that's what, I don't want to send that message because this is the most important thing that we do. Jesus' birth into this world and him giving his life for us, this, this affects every, it should, every minute of our lives, not only here but in eternity. This is, this is everything. This is the ball game, okay? Why we wouldn't take time to gather together and, and acknowledge that, you know, I just, I just think that's a mistake. And uh, if there's one thing that we need to be not telling the world at this point in time is that our faith and our relationship with Jesus isn't important because it really is. And we can see we can see the darkness in the world around us all the time. So we have just uh, at the conclusion of celebrating Advent this last month, preparation, preparing ourselves for understanding the coming of Jesus and what that meant when He brought into the world the aspects of hope and of peace, joy, love. There's, I would add a fifth one if, if you could for Advent. Of course, it's only you know four Sundays. So, but Jesus is also the light of the world. I've always thought that would be you know if you're going to have one, an additional uh, element to, to uh, Advent, it would be the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. That while mankind, God wants us to to prepare ourselves and understand. And you know every person 
we, we, we experience times of peace and joy and love and, and those things in our lives. And But what we need to understand with considering Advent is that what Jesus was doing, he wasn't saying you never had a joyful moment in your life prior to my coming. But now he's saying we can have an eternal joy, an eternal peace, because we can be secure in knowing what is ours in eternity and in the inheritance that is ours. And we have all that. We have all that not just in momentary glimpses here in our lives on earth, but we have that even in the midst of, and what Jesus is saying in, in the Advent is you can have joy even in the midst of trouble. Not just joy in like I really have a joyful moment, but even when there's trials and tribulations, I can still have joy. I can still have peace. I can still have hope beyond what I'm going through right now. If there's difficulties and even sometimes tragedy in our lives, I can still have hope beyond this because Jesus came into the world. It's not just a momentary thing, but it is an ongoing <coughs> spiritual thing and an eternal thing. And all of this is true because a Savior is born. He saves us from all of the, the, the fallen nature and all the limits of this world. So I want to look just briefly this morning. What does that mean to be saved? Jesus is a savior. What does it mean to be saved? I want to go and turn to Luke 2 and start at reading verse 8 through 12. And it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be to all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. So he says that we have a Savior is born, and he tells us specifically that that Savior is Christ, that's the person, the Lord. And I want to look at those two, two elements, Christ and Lord, and what that means to us here. But before I get into that, this is just always a fascinating thing to me. I want to consider the manger before I get into the aspects of Jesus as Christ and as Lord. The manger, why was Jesus born in a manger? Such an interesting, uh, you know, nothing happens by accident. There's a purpose as to why Jesus was born in, in, in a stable, in a manger, and all of these things. And there's a lot of different aspects to a manger and, and, and its function and what it represents. But to me, the two biggest ones are the fact that a manger is very common. We, we see uh, when we have the nativities or um, you see them all over the place. And a manger was simply a, a, a feeding trough, so to speak. Um, it, it's just very common just made out of wood, just common, it's rustic, it's common. And we see that this is Jesus being born as God coming into the world. It's God leaving his throne and his glory in heaven and coming into the world in the most common way. All of you are wonderful people and unique and special in certain ways. But let's face it, we're all pretty common folk. Amen? And, and I'm, I, I think that's a good thing. We're all pretty common folk. God came not to princes and kings, but he came to everybody. He says a savior is born to all people, all people, even us common folk. He came to in a way that anybody could relate to him. The gospel, I believe, is very simple. It's not that difficult to understand. He wanted to be common. He wanted to reach every person. So I believe that the manger is common because we see God leaving the glory and all the majesty of heaven and coming and being born into the world in the most common way. I mean, let's face it, the world in its fallen nature is a pretty is a step down if you're God sitting on your throne in heaven. Amen? It's a step down. The manger represents to me God becoming man, the glorious becoming the common. And reaching out to all people. And also, a manger, I looked in the Greek, the word is fat, fat, I guess it makes sense, fatne, that's the way I would say it, P-H-A-T-N-E, fatne, fatne, it means to eat. That makes sense. It's a manger, it's a trough, it's a feeding trough. And what are we supposed to do? God comes into the world as man in this common way to every single person, and he tells us, I'm the bread of life. If you eat of me, 
You're never going to be hungry. Your salvation is this. He wants us to partake of him. We see that in the elements of the communion and what Jesus did at the Last Supper of serving the bread and the wine, saying, this is my body, eat. This is my blood, drink. He wants us to partake of him. So I see in the manger these two common things. He is he's God becoming common man, becoming Jesus. And he says, here I am, partake of me, eat of me, born in a manger. But we also have this idea too, as I said, Jesus is the Savior. A Savior is born. What is he saving us from? You know, I often usually just initially think, well, he's saving me from myself. <clears throat> Uh, I'm, my biggest, I'm my, my biggest enemy. But we know that God saves us from sin. Our sin has separated us from God. We, we've, we've lost our position with him. He, we, are, uh, we are saved from the lack and the limitations of this world. God brings blessing uh, and, and, and provision into our lives. Um, he cleanses our conscience of our guilt. He can restore to us a sense of innocence that we've lost. We can have our, 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 our bodies, our, all of our uh, being restored, our emotions, our, psych, our, our, our spirit, our bodies. He brings health and restorations to us physically. The idea of the full meaning of Savior, we think of just saving us of our sins, but the word Savior means so much more. It has a, it has a, a, a whole area of meaning, if you will. It means to save, to deliver. It means to protect, to heal to preserve, to do well, and to make whole. That's ultimately, to me, the idea of Savior doesn't mean just simply saving us from our sins. It means God makes us whole. What we lost through our fall into sin, he restores all of that. He makes us whole back to what God intended for us when he created man in the Garden of Eden. And the angels declared to the shepherds, they said that Jesus, the Savior, is born. He is Christ the Lord. So the Savior is going to restore us. He's going to make us whole. Why? He makes us whole because he is Christ and he is Lord. And those are two different things. He is Christ the Lord. So first of all, I want to look at this idea of Christ. What does it, what does it mean, Christ? You have to understand, when we talk about Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. Like, like Randy Bevington. That's not what it is. Christ is a title. It's his Position, if you will, his title bestowed upon him by God. It is synonymous with the idea of Messiah. Christ means anointed. So Jesus is the anointed. He is the anointed one of God. So when it says that he is Christ, it means he is the anointed one and he is Lord. And we'll look at Lord. But what does it mean to be anointed? Luke 4, 18 and 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, this is Jesus speaking, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the, the year of the Lord's favor. God anointed Jesus, and Jesus says, God anointed me. He commissioned me. Just, I mean, how many different ways? How do I want to say this? He commissioned me. We think of the anointing oil. That, that the in the Old Testament they would pour the anointing oil over the head of the priest and it would run down their, over their entire body. It's God placing his anointing on Jesus. For what purpose? Why did he, why was he anointed? What, what was this anointing going to accomplish? Well, he tells us right here. Jesus was anointed to preach good news. Hey, you know you're separated from God. You know that he doesn't find you to be righteous. You're lost. You cannot receive the inheritance of heaven. Well, guess what? I got good news for you. Jesus was anointed so that you could be restored to be made whole again, so that you could receive that, to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to, for the prisoners, those that have, are in bondage to sin, those that have strongholds in their life. Jesus was anointed so that we don't have to live as prisoners of sin and prisoners of these things that keep us from being fully what God would want us to be. We can be delivered from that. Why? Because Jesus was anointed for that purpose. Why is he anointed? Because he's the Christ. That's what it means. He anointed him to recover sight for the blind, to bring physical restoration and healing to us, to release the oppressed. I don't want to get too far into this, but when it, the release the oppressed. Oppression to me is one of those areas that we're only oppressed if we choose to be. 
And I can understand when we live in sin and we, we're aware of our, our faults and our failures and all those kind of things, it can be oppressive. But when we realize that we're forgiven and that God loves us, I can choose to embrace that and I don't have to be oppressed. I, have, I can have that fear. All the world can come against us. This is what it, the difference, as I said, in, the, in our physical lives, we can say live in a momentary joy. We have a joyful event take place. We all experience that. But Advent tells us to prepare yourself. Jesus is coming, Christ the Lord, and you can have joy even in the midst of the turmoil, even in the midst of the negative events. So if I can have joy in the midst of the failures and the faults and you know, the failures of this world, then I don't have to be oppressed. I can be released from it. That's what my knowledge and my relationship with Jesus bring me. Why? Because even in the, mo even in the moment, if I'm going through a hard time, I know it one, it doesn't have to last. And two, I have eternity in heaven, in this glorious place that Jesus has gone to prepare for me. Jesus was anointed to give us this hope, to give us life, a restoration, an understanding. Even if we're not experiencing it here, we know that it's a promise that's coming in the future. And he, he's anointed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I actually think that that's a good thing to pray. When you're praying for somebody, this might, you probably maybe never heard this. We say, oh, Lord, bless this person, you know, which is, but that's good. Bless them and heal them and do this and do whatever. What about this? If I'm praying for Don. Don, I'm going to say, God, do me, do me a favor. Do this for Don. Can I ask God for a favor? According to what this says? It says that I'm, I'm living in a, in a time of what? The Lord's favor. I don't know. It kind of, sounds kind of weird, right? Hey, God, do me a favor. We ask each other to do a favor for, for, for one another, right? Why? Because we have a relationship. And we know that this person, we can do something for this person. So you say, hey, can you do me a favor? Do you, let me ask you this. Do you ever ask somebody to do you a favor unless you're pretty confident? They'll say, yes. Right? We ask people to do favors because we're pretty confident that they will say yes. Why shouldn't I be confident that God will do me a favor if I ask when he tells me that Jesus was anointed for the purpose of giving us this time of favor? Just a thought. So he is anointed for these purposes. Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Jesus was anointed. He's the Christ. He was anointed. For what other purpose do we see here? He was anointed for the purpose of doing good. Well, that's a good thing. Of doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. So when Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, God anointed Jesus with the purpose of doing what? Giving us freedom from these attacks of Satan. It says, healing all who are under the power of the devil. So if Satan is coming to steal, kill, and destroy, he wants to restore what Satan is stealing. Those who are, he's anointed for that purpose. We can know. See, this is telling us why, did, why was a Savior born? Well, we look at what he was anointed to do. That's why he is Christ the Lord. The Savior is born. Christ the Lord. He is born for these purposes. So we see that Jesus is anointed as the Christ to heal us, to deliver us, to restore us, to give us favor. All of these things. But then we see that he's also Lord. What does it mean that he is Lord? 2 Corinthians 4 5 says, For we do not preach ourselves, but we preach Christ the Lord and ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. So Jesus, as Lord, he is our servant. We submit to his lordship, and in doing so, if we're really going to allow him to be Lord of our lives, then we do what he does for us. We repeat. <coughs> 
what he does. Jesus is the world's greatest servant. He came and he gave his life. And then we're supposed to do what he did, and it says what? Serve. Serve others. Why? Because Jesus is my Lord. I obey him. If he came as a servant, then I'm supposed to do what he did. I'm going to serve others too. Lordship is that we submit to his we submit to his authority. We submit to his position. And because Christ is a servant, we also should be a servant. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, yet for, us, uh, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and from whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. There's one Lord. There can only be one Lord. If you have more than one Lord, then you don't have any Lords. Because the idea of Lord is that he is the ultimate. He is the one supreme being. We have one Lord, and he's in charge of everything. That's what it means that Christ would be our Lord. So he's anointed to come into this world because he is Christ the Savior. He's anointed to restore us back, to make us whole. Even in the midst of this fallen world, to have hope and joy and peace. And that we follow his lordship. He's Christ the Lord. We do what he did. While I'm in this world, I am to serve as he served. Why? Because he's my Lord. And that's what he wants me to do. There's good news. A savior is born. Well, what does that mean? It means he was born into this world for a specific purpose. He was anointed for a specific purpose. God sent him. The birth of Jesus in this world is not an accident. It's not something that just happened to happen throughout the course of history. It was planned before the foundations of the world were even laid. God knew that he would send Jesus one day into this world. That the God of creation would become a common man, be born in a manger. He would say, here I am, partake of me, and if you do, I will be your savior. I will redeem you from this fallen mess. <laughs> it's almost amazing to me, this world that we live in. We live in, um, if we look around, if I said, if I watch the news too much, we live in the most ridiculous world. We are living in the stupidest times that I'm in my lifetime, for sure. Everything that we know to be good and decent and common sense, all the powers that be tell us we're completely wrong and just the opposite is true. And yet, at the same time, we live, we're pretty blessed with life and the people that God gives us to share that life with. This is our blessing family and our friends, our church body, and in the midst of the most insane things going on out in the world, we come here and realize, man, we're pretty, we're pretty blessed. God wants us to understand that and enjoy it, but at the same time, know that there's so much more. God's going, to, as good, God's going to save us out of this insane world. We can make our own little sanity here, but ultimately he's going to save us out of this world. The Savior is born. Christ the Lord. That Savior was anointed to free us up from all of the failings and shortcomings of this world if we will allow him to be Lord of our lives and obey him and do what he does. Do what he tells us that we should be doing. So, my message this morning is no different than it is every Christmas. I mean, there's only so many sermons you can preach about Christmas because it's all about what? <coughs> a Savior is born. I mean, all I want to do this morning is to remind you that, in fact, we do have a Savior. That's what this is all about. That's why we, that's why you got out of your pajamas, okay, turned the coffee pot off, all right, and came to church. On a Christmas morning because a Savior was born to us 
And that means that we have a favored life in God, that we have eternal promises in God. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior is born. That's what Christmas is all about.